All right, so if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 2 today. Um, this year, I have done a lot, and I've almost been with you uh, a year now, kind of mid next week will be, um, will be a year, and so I've just kind of been reflecting a lot on what we've gone over, and really we've done a lot of kind of laying the foundations of things, I've kind of taken you on a journey of uh, spiritual gifts and spiritual battles and, um, you know, how to armor up to, you know, fight those battles. And, you know, we've gone through a lot and, and repeatedly over and over again, I tell you how important it is for you to pick up this book and read it. Now, uh, today we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that in some kind of practical ways. And so kind of continuing with our building on the foundations of, of Jesus um, little series that we're doing, we're going to talk about studying the Bible. Now, I think everybody knows that there is a difference between reading something and studying something. Um, Mary and I went out with a couple friend of ours, and we just went out to dinner and we went to this little place, and they were doing trivia that night, and it was uh, Harry Potter trivia. Okay, um, any Harry Potter fans out here? Now, a couple of you. So, I never read any of the books because I don't really like to read that often, except for this. Um, and But I enjoyed the movies. I thought they were okay. And, and so I thought, uh, we'll, we'll be all right at this. I've seen all the movies. And so we went to trivia. Well, then we learned really quick that there was a big difference between watching it for the enjoyment of the story and really getting into that universe and studying it. And let me tell you, there were some people at trivia night that night that had studied Harry Potter, you know, and that's kind of the context here that, um, first off, the very first thing that I'll say about scripture is the first step before I give you any of the other ones is simply read for the story. If you come to a book and you want to say, uh, today we're in Mark, so if you want to use that as an example, I want to learn more about Mark. I want to study Mark. The first thing I want you to do is simply read Mark. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to understand everything. Just like when you watch a movie, sometimes you don't have to, you know, you, you're like, well, I'm kind of confused about that. Maybe it gets answered later on. Maybe it doesn't. It gets you thinking. You can take a couple of mental notes as you go, but kind of get the basic understanding of the story, of the context of the book. It's going to help you vastly with everything else we're talking about. Now, what we are talking about is studying. Now, of course, I've shared this verse with you probably a hundred times now already. Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen: Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is our command, is to study. We are not just called to read. We are not just called to have a basic understanding. He wants us to study. So as we go through this today, if you have your Bibles, actually use your Bibles. Okay? We're going to look at this story. This story, it's a familiar story, and there's a lot that we can learn from it. There's a lot, maybe a couple of deeper things than just what we see at the surface level, okay? Um, also, I know, for especially a few people in the back, this is going to be kind of hard to read. Um, I will read them out loud, we will go over them, and then the board will be here if you want to come up after and take a picture of all, you know, of things, or take a picture of the slides, um, that'll be available to you. Okay. So when we read for a deeper understanding, when we read to study, there's really three questions that we're going to ask. What did the text mean to the original hearers? Now, think of the, say, the letter to the Corinthians. Okay? We know that some of Paul's letters, because he said it at the beginning, was in response to a letter he received. Well, we have a one-sided part of that conversation. We have Paul's response. We don't know what the church originally sent. Okay, so 
when Paul answers them, it's going to mean something to them that it may not mean to us today. But it meant something to them. There was a reason that they were asking these things. Um, same thing with, say, the Gospel of Matthew. If you read through the Gospel of Matthew, he structures his Gospel in a certain way. Well, when you study and you look into it, Matthew wrote his Gospel for the Jewish people, which is why Matthew, in particular, makes so many references to Old Testament prophecies. Because the Jewish audience would have known those prophecies and it would have meant something deeper to them. Right? And so, what did the text mean to the original hearers? The next big question I want to answer, what does the text mean for us today? What can we take out of it? What can we take that we can apply to our lives? How can it help us grow? And the third question is, how does it fit into the rest of Scripture? How does it fit into the rest of Scripture? Okay. No, I didn't do that just to be theatrical. I did that so it was shorter and fit through the door. Yeah. It just happened to work out that it makes me look smart and fancy that I flipped the dark board around. <laughs> we have three questions to answer. This is the goal. Now, how you reach those answers can vary. You can go about it in your own process or maybe in your own order. This is the order that I use. This is the order that I learned. This is, quite frankly, the order the Leadership Academy has taught me. Um, really, even how to use this in an altered state, but use this for sermon prep. Um, this is what we're gonna go through. Seven steps, seven key things that you can do, seven study tips that you can use that's gonna help you to answer these three questions. Now, I know it seems like a lot, and at first you're going to be kind of slow at it because it's a new process, okay? But it's not as long as it seems at first, and once you get used to it, it just goes faster and faster, and um, especially once you learn more about Scripture, some of it you can just kind of skip and move on because you already know the answers. Um, if you could imagine that you were following this to build a paper, for instance, this, you're going to start at one, and it's going to be a big paragraph, but it's going to build on each other. So as you go down and answer some of these, uh, by the time you get 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, it's going to be just a quick one sentence, a quick bullet point, because it's going to feed off of everything, all the other work that you did ahead of time. Um, so it's really not as long as what it seems. Okay, the very first text to answer these questions. What does it uh, mean to the original hearers? What does it mean to us? How does it fit in Scripture? It's simply to read the text for basic understanding. Okay? So I am assuming going into this study that you have read all of Mark and that you kind of put in your brain, hey, I kind of want to know more about chapter 2. I'm going to go back and read this section again. Okay? So that's where we're at. So let's read Mark chapter 2 together. Um, it's going to be verses 1 through 12, and it's a story that we're all familiar with. Jesus is teaching in a house. There's a big crowd of people. Um, there is a paralyzed man whose friends are carrying him. They can't make it to Jesus through the crowd, so they go up on the roof, and they make a hole, and they lower him down through the roof, and he sees them. And he heals the man. We're all familiar with this story. But let's read it. Um, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And again he entered into Capernaum for some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. 
And straight away, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man must speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And then he turns, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Amen. So we have a basic understanding of the text. I kind of said it at the beginning. Jesus is teaching. There's a crowd. There's a paralyzed man that is forgiven and healed. There's also some scribes there that kind of oppose what he did and question in their hearts, and Jesus confronts them. We have the basic understanding of this text. Okay, we kind of know what it's going to say, and, and I know I'm rushing through this because we have a lot to get through, but you know, this is, you're going to take some time here reading this and gathering these things. The next step after we have it for the basic understanding is we put the text in its larger context. How does it fit within the passages around it? Now, when we look at the larger context of this passage, we will see that in chapter 1 of Mark, we see multiple healing stories. This is the third of the healings. Now, after this, there's a couple of things that happen, but in chapter 3, there's another healing. There's kind of a, a narrative here, and, and this interaction is kind of this climatic scene, if you will, to these other miracles and healings that Jesus was doing. Right? We can see we put it in this larger context. Okay, maybe there's more to this. Why does Mark choose to write his gospel in such a way that all of these things are lined up? Right? And so these are some of those questions as we go through the process we'll answer. So as we study, things are going to come up. But that's part of <coughs> studying and that gets us to point three, which is ask questions of the text. Now, I, I like to describe this part as kind of playing in Scripture a little bit, okay? Now, Mary and I, we, we did this with this passage. We did this, this whole thing, and, and when we first did it, these are some of the questions that we had. What was Jesus preaching about to this group of people? Right now, clearly... That kind of question will show you, Scripture doesn't say what he was preaching. And some questions that you may have and you may ask of Scripture and ask for yourself, Scripture may not give you an answer for. And that's okay. You know, but it's, okay, it's important for you to kind of explore your thought process behind it all. Because that's how you're going to get a deeper understanding. Okay? Who are the four men that carried the man with palsy? What is the significance, if any... Of the, of the men lowering the man with palsy from above through the roof. Here's a good one. Why didn't Jesus forgive the sins of all five men when he said he's seen their faith? Why did these men go through such great lengths to get this paralyzed man to Jesus? Why did the scribes react the way that they did? Was it out of fear, out of curiosity for what was happening, out of just, you know, um, confusion? 
And then the question that Jesus asked, which is, which is easier, forgiveness or get up and walk? These are just a couple of the questions that we had as we went through this process that I encourage you when you're studying a text, play in it a little bit. I mean, scripture is exciting, right? Don't be scared to ask questions, even if you yourself kind of feel like it's a silly question. Ask it anyway. Maybe you'll get an answer, maybe not. But once you're done asking questions and reflecting on the text, um, you'll kind of start the process of answering some of those questions. Okay, and one way that you may find it helpful is to explore the text historically. And that's our point four, is explore the history of the text. Now, I propose the question, why did Mark start his gospel with multiple healings and miracles of Jesus? Well, when you explore the history of it, you'll find out that his gospel was written primarily to Gentile Christians in the Roman Empire and for Christians outside of Palestine who did not witness Jesus' miracles firsthand. These are people that have kind of heard secondhand maybe some of the stories and um, haven't had a belief in Christ, but he was writing it to those who didn't get to experience these things. And so he leads with... These are the miracles and the wondrous things that we all got so excited about. These are the events that you kind of heard through the grapevine and was questioning, man, is that really true? Did that really happen? And he is solidifying all of that and solidifying who Jesus is to these people. And so then when you look at it and you understand, man, Mark is writing his gospel to Gentiles who didn't really get to experience that. He's writing that gospel to us. Then you kind of start to understand and you start to see the big picture of, okay, now I understand the structure a little bit more. The next, it's a simple question, what kind of text is it? And what I mean by that is, is it narrative? Is it telling a story? Is it a parable? Um, is it a poem? Is it a song? Just differentiating what kind of text it is, which of course that happens real quick, right? It's easy to figure out. Um, that can help you in your understanding. Some of the Psalms, for instance, they're, they're poems. It's poetic, they're beautiful, and when they write them, they write using a lot of you know, hyperbole and, and exaggeration to get a point across and to paint a, you know, this beautiful picture of things. Um, you're not gonna take some of the Psalms as literal as you will a narrative story about like what happened here in Mark. Right? So there's a difference. So just ask yourself, what kind of text is it? The next one, which kind of helps you answer the bottom question up here, how does the text fit into the rest of Scripture? Okay? The, the sixth tip that I have for you is explore the text theologically. Now, what I mean by that is we have all these theological terms like hope, faith, salvation, forgiveness, you know, these key words that mean something, especially in the bigger context of scripture, right? When you hear forgiveness, that's a theological term. Even if you don't really assign it that way in your mind normally, um, it, it is. And, and you, when you hear forgiveness, you know what it's talking about. And so as you get into Scripture, and as you try to see how does this passage fit into the rest of Scripture, you have to look at key words like that. What is this text saying theologically? Now, I want to challenge you a little bit with our Mark text. What is the main purpose of Mark? Now, the heading on my Bible says Jesus heals um, something about Jesus heals a man with palsy, right? Jesus heals a paralyzed man. However, your text is gonna is gonna say it. Jesus heals a man with palsy. This story is not about healing. If you read the story and you look at the theological context of it, this is a story about forgiveness. It mentions forgiveness twice as much as it talks about healing. That tells you something. 
That stands out. It should stand out. See, what was uh, the basic understanding of it was simply, okay, Jesus, this is another healing story. We, we read two of those. We see this. There's another one coming. Okay, Jesus is telling us about him healing somebody. But that's not what Jesus is doing. Yes, somebody got healed in the process, but Jesus is revealing himself as someone who is able to forgive sins. Jesus is revealing himself as the Son of God, as someone who has authority and power. Now this passage in Mark, when we look at it theologically, really comes to light and starts to mean something different to us. The last point that I have, consult the experts by using commentaries, by talking to your pastor, by um, watching sermons on the topic, on, on YouTube, on however it is you want to do it. I will just warn you, though, that people are limited. Um, let's use the story in Mark, for instance. Really, we are taught that if we are going to preach a text, that you should have one overarching main point that we should preach. But I can use this text to preach forgiveness in Christ. I can use this text to preach seeking Christ for healing in our lives. I can use this text um, focused from the perspective of the scribes. And there's a, a lesson there about, about doubt, about questioning Jesus in your life. I can preach this text from the, from the viewpoint of the men, or the paralyzed man even, who is seeking Jesus out. Who had to work. It took action in their faith. I mean, there's like four or five sermons right there that I can preach out of this one text. And so that's why it's important when you hit the last step, which is um, looking at the commentaries, that you look at multiple sources. Because if you look at just one, you're going to get a really narrow view of what that text is trying to say. You're going to get what that person thought, okay, this is probably the most important thing for me to type right now. And so it's important for you to explore multiple things. Now, there's a reason I put this one last. Right? And it's just for that, because I just listed off four or five different ways that you can look at this text. Four or five different messages you can hear from this text. If you started with commentaries, you're going to have a skewed view of the rest of it. If you start with commentaries, you're never going to have the joy and the fun of asking questions of the text. If you start with the commentaries, they may give you a little bit of the, the history all alone, and you miss out on that joy of exploring it yourself. And these things are really exciting. They're fun to do once you get into it. So, using this method, looking at Mark chapter 2, how do we answer these questions? What are the answers? What did the text mean to the original hearers? Well, we kind of covered that a little bit. These are people, these are Gentiles that didn't experience these things, and they are discovering the awe and wonder of Jesus and the power of him for the first time. What does this text mean for us today? What does this text want to do in our lives? Now, it challenges us to reflect on the necessity of faith in Jesus for forgiveness and healing. He saw their faith. Then he responded. It additionally kind of stresses that sometimes faith requires action. That we can't just expect that God is just going to do everything. Sometimes it takes some push from us, right? 
God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to strive and grow closer to him. And that's kind of like this whole point, which is there's a difference between reading scripture and studying scripture. If God tells you study to show thyself approved, God wants you to study. He wants you to put some effort into it, some action. Here's the one that stood out to me the most when I was doing this. Faith requires action, and that sometimes we have to push through the crowd to seek Jesus in our lives. Sometimes we have to push against the people that's in front of us that's stopping us from getting to Jesus and fulfilling the real purpose that we have at that moment. Now in this context, and for us, the, the hard challenge there is these were also people that was there to see Jesus. Now this kind of ties in, I'll give you a little sneak peek and a glimpse of what we're talking about next week, which is kind of conflict resolution, okay? But sometimes the people that are hindering us the most from getting close to Jesus are the other Christians in front of us. When the people that are also trying to seek forgiveness, the people that are also trying to seek healing, because those people are broken like we are broken. They are lost like we are lost. They make mistakes like we make mistakes, and sometimes they get in our way. Now, the men did not shove their way through the crowd. They did not break the legs of the other people seeking Christ in front of them so they could get to the line. They did not grab the back of their shirt and pull them behind them. They did not hinder their walk and their push to get to Christ. They simply found another way. There's a lesson there for us. These are things that this text is teaching us today. How does this text fit into the rest of Scripture? Well, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus has power and authority. Jesus is revealing himself. Jesus is forgiving sins, and, and, he, and he even tells them, Thy sins be forgiven thee. When the scribes questioned them, it said, Immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves. Jesus is showing us, I know your thoughts. I know the intentions of your heart. You don't even have to say it out loud. I know you. Because I am your God. And he asks, why do you reason these things in your heart? Why do you question me? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. And Jesus, like Jesus does, he asks the question, he gives us the answer. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said, this is why I did. This is why I responded that way. This is why, I mean, knowing the intentions of your heart, why I did not give you the healing in your life that you were seeking. But I gave you something else instead. This is why I took a spiritual route and not a physical route. Is there a lesson for us to learn there? Now in the end, the man still got, the man still got healed. The man still got healed. The man also got forgiveness from Christ. Now, we learned a lot about this text, and I know I did a lot of the groundwork beforehand, but I only got there because of this, and because I asked these simple questions. Now, like I said, it's going to start a little slow, 
but some of these get real fast. You can answer real easy. And the more you study and the more you know, the easier it's going to be. I started this with telling you about the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was written to the Jewish community, which is why he structured it a certain way. If I'm studying something in Matthew, I don't really have to look up the history of it. I can skip the text because I kind of know it. Now, I will admit, I'm a King James fan, and there's some King James words that we just don't use anymore. Maybe the meanings change, and sometimes I do stumble across the word that I have to look up the history of. Now, you're going to run into situations like that, but all of those answers and all of those things sort themselves out when you follow this God. So I hope this is going to be a blessing for you today. This is, this is what I have for you, and, and I encourage you. Study to show yourself approved unto the Lord. I'm going to read that verse one last time, and then we're going to pray and close. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Precious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this glorious and wonderful gift that you have given us. Now, we are so blessed. We have your living word in our hands, something that people used to die for to get a single leaflet of. And we have it readily available for us all the time. And because it's so easily accessible, it's ignored most of the time. And it's ignored because of our own selfishness, of our own busyness, of, of the world that we've created for ourselves most of the time. So Lord, as your word says, help us to crucify ourselves daily. Help us to um, just put away the desires of the flesh. Help us to, to put away uh, an hour of TV at night that we want to watch so we can sit and focus on reading your word together. Lord, help us this Advent season to prepare ourselves for your coming. Lord, help us to imagine that on December 25th, that's it for us. That either you're coming here or we are going there, but our life, as we know it here on earth, ends on that day. Lord, help us to live that way for just a couple of weeks. Lord, help us to remind us of the importance of of your word, of studying. And God, we thank you for guides like this that I've presented today that can help us to gain a deeper understanding of you. Lord, I couldn't do this life without your word, without your love, without your spirit in my life. Thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen.